So this is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I'm here with Jimmy Church. And uh, wow, it's really early in the morning. <laughs> yes, it is. Here in LA, for me, uh, for us night night owls, those types. Uh, so uh, Jimmy, thank you for waking up uh, on time to do this today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always a pleasure, Carrie. You know that. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is just very casual. We, I, you know, I, I was on your show. I've been on your show twice. And, uh, and I just thought we, we have to return the favor. So here we are. And um, I, I know it's the middle of the day. The reason this is not at night, guys, is because Jimmy's on the radio at night. So uh, this was our only option. Um, so uh, we've got a chat going. You've got a chat going. So we can also take questions from the chat as we go or, or near the end, whatever, whatever works out. Um, what I want to do is, first of all, <laughs> uh, let's, let's give you some background because this is your interview. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you um, who you are and, and how you got into this sector. And I, I know some of these answers and maybe some of your fans know these answers, but we could have new people on board who don't know who Jimmy Church even is, even though sure. I think your word is getting out there uh, very quickly. Well, um, and I've, yeah, it, it's kind of funny because I've done a lot of, uh, and it's, uh, again, thank you for having me on the show. And I, let me say this to everybody. Carrie and I uh, talk probably a few times a week, uh, very long animated uh, conversations on the phone, and we always... Uh, stop ourselves in the middle of the conversation and wish that we could share those conversations with everybody. Um, and, and so we're, what we're doing now is what we do all week long. And uh, so uh, hopefully we'll capture some, some of that magic. But um, I've done a lot of media uh, over the last month or two, and I've had that same question. Jimmy, where did you come from? And um, because we have such an old established uh, uh, community in ufology. I've always felt like I was a part of that community because I was always researching and involved and reading. Um, but, but for everybody else, I'm, I'm sort of new and I get that. I understand. Uh, I, I stepped in for art bell about a year ago. It's been a year now that I've been in, uh, the chair and, uh, I, I came from a sports background, but before, uh, or I don't even really need to mention that, but yes, I had a successful show and, and, and sports casting was always a passion and sports are a passion, but it's not what I wanted to do. Uh, I was on with George Norrie, as you know, last week and George asked me the same question and, and he said, you know, how did you make that, that transformation from sports, you know, a successful sports show to this? And I, and I said, I came out of the closet. If this is what I've always <laughs> wanted to do. I came out of the closet. And now I'm happy. Uh, the best way to, to try to explain it is, here, I did, a, uh, I did my show last night for three hours. I'm off the air last night. I wind down. What am I doing first thing this morning? I'm on with you, Carrie. And I'm happy. In, in a couple hours, I'm doing my show again. Tonight, I, I, we were just talking, I have Graham Hancock on the show. Who could not be happier than enjoying that type of success? Uh, I have been welcomed, for the most part, with open arms into the UFO community. And I think that they need, or paranormal, I should say, community. And I think that they, uh, you, everybody else, they needed a breath of fresh air another uh, a take, another look at it, and somebody that takes it very, very serious. And I think that has a lot to do with the success of the show in that um, here comes a guy from a different background and it's coming in, um, kick-starting and re-kick-starting uh, the paranormal, the fringe sciences, and, and taking it very, very serious. And I think that has a lot to do with it. 
All right. Well, that's uh, that's true. Absolutely. Uh, well, okay, but but in terms of your background, like you know, growing up and all of this, uh, and and I I don't know. Maybe you've been asked these things before, but I don't know this. Uh, have you seen a UFO? Yes, three. Okay. Three. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and I and I have. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll do it on on the quick side. Uh, the first. Uh, the first sighting I had was up in Monterey and I was up there with some friends and we were photographing, uh, ourselves at the edge of the ocean. We were on mountain bikes and we stopped and we were taking turns. There was four of us and we were taking turns, taking pictures of ourselves. So, you know, three, one taking the picture of three guys, right? And then we were rotating. So everybody would get in the shot. And it was my turn to take the picture. And one of the guys says, what is that? And he points up to the sky. And it was an old, uh, you know, film camera. This is 1995, 1996. And I look up and there's a black triangle. But it was high, high, high. I'm guessing 50,000 feet, you know, way up in in the clouds. But it was ripping across the sky. And I grabbed the camera. It was moving so fast. You know, a jet at that height moves very, very slow across the sky. We're used to this. This was hauling butt. I want to use another word. (laughs) And and so I grab the camera and I take a shot. By the time I wound the camera, I go up and look again, and it was stationary and then shot straight up into the clouds and disappeared into the atmosphere. That was about 5, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, bright sky. And... About six months later, I was developing the film. Uh, I had a bunch of film, and and I come across these pictures of clouds. I was like, "What? What, what is this?" And there was that black triangle, and I I put a jeweler's loop on it, and it turned out it wasn't a black triangle; it was a black pyramid. Okay. Really. And it was a like a square bottom, just like a pyramid in Egypt, square bottom. With uh, with a triangle top, way up in the sky, way, way, way high. So that was my first one. Uh, the and second, there's, let me just say, there is a military base right off Monterey. So yes, yes, yes. It could have been anything, but it was the way that it. Well, it had no wings either. It, that was the weird thing. Very uh, weird. Yeah, uh, yeah and way back then. How it, cool. Yeah, how how it was flying, I have no idea. But that was something that. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, Carrie, I didn't tell anybody about that for years. But but uh, let me ask you right there, because did you, were you like a UFO kind of person at that point? Or yes. was this your first oh, yeah. exposure? Oh, 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 I was involved in Paranet. <laughs> when Paranet was was on the net back, uh, you know, at the, the very first start of uh, uh, the Internet and, and UFO Mind. And all of those early, early websites. Now, before that, yeah, I, I read Fowler's books and uh, Communion and, and so forth. Now, backing up, if you want to back up before that, before the, my, my sightings, um, my mom was a crazy woman. And so I grew up in, a, in, in the best, most endearing of terms of crazy. She was awesome. And she was, this was in the 60s. And early 70s, she was into Edgar Casey. She was into ghost writing. She, her and, and my Aunt Z, who just passed away last week, uh, would sit around and Ouija board all night and drink coffee. <laughs> and I'm, I'm five years old watching this stuff. Okay, and where did you grow up? Uh, I was an Army brat, so we did it all around the world. You know, every three years, new, new city, new country, new ah, Army base, that kind of thing. My dad was in the Army band. He was in the Army band. Okay. What did he play? Yep. Uh, trombone. He and was he, band leader, actually. He was band master. So okay. he was the guy conducting the orchestra. And you uh, you actually are a musician as well, right? Yes. Yep, 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 yep. You play yep. guitar? Uh, play guitar. Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. So now, so, okay, fast forward from here, uh, and you're growing up, well, uh, in various places. Is there any place that you spent, uh, you know, more time than not when you were a kid? 
Uh, no, not really. It, it pretty much three three years. You know, this the standard military issue every three years. But you pull three up years it. around the United States or around the world? Around the world, uh, uh, Germany, uh, as well as Panama, South America, or Central America. Um, I was there when I was older. I was there when I was in my teens in high school. So, and then back to the United States. So, okay, the the rotation went like this: so we Chicago at Fort Sheridan. Uh, Indianapolis at Fort Ben Harrison, uh, Kalamazoo, when my dad went to music school at Western Michigan, uh, Würzburg, Frankfurt, uh, and then back to the States again. We went back to Fort Harrison for a second tour, and then that was it. That was, uh, that was it for me. I stayed in Indianapolis until I came out to California. Okay. And you've been in California how long? Uh, since 1983, 1984. Oh, so, so you're, so you're, a basically a local to, <laughs> yeah, now, now, now I'm from California. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so now we're up to the second sighting. So what, then what happened? Second sighting was my wife and I, Rita, were here in the Valley. We were coming off of, uh, La Tuna Canyon Road off of the 210, which, uh, for everybody here, that's the, uh, that's the east side of the valley, coming from Pasadena into the valley. We're coming out of the mountains. We're coming down Latuna Canyon into the valley. And Rita turns to me and says, what is that? And I look, and our sunroof was open in the car. And I looked to where she was looking. She's looking up. And right out of the windshield, pew, it was a white orb globe. I have no idea how big, but I'm going to say... 20 meters, maybe across 30 feet. Um, and it landed, it came, it, it lasted for about a second straight down and landed like in downtown Van Nuys. And I was expecting a, a huge explosion. Okay. That's what I thought. And nothing happened. I immediately, immediately called Wolf McCarran of MUFON and said, Wolf, did you see that? No. Any reports? No. I said, note this right now. It's 1024. We just had a sighting, something strange. And, uh, and we didn't know what it was. And the next day, well, I immediately went home and checked all the websites, KABC, you know, all, all the local news channels, nothing. It didn't make sense to me how you could have three, four million people in the valley and something like that happen and nobody mention it. I followed the LA Times for about a week and there was nothing there and nobody reported anything on MUFON. I know what I saw. It was crazy. It didn't leave a light trail or anything. It was just a bright flash of, of a round, it was white glowing orb and it just streaked right, right to downtown Van Nuys. And I thought, what a it, trip. It, it, yeah. And then, okay. What uh, year was that? You know that would have been 2010. Oh, so not that long ago. No, no, very recent. Okay. And then about a year ago, I just spoke about this at a at a seminar, and the video is online. Uh, I was in the Honda parking lot of Honda over here in the valley, um, uh, Galpin Honda. And I'm walking out of the building, and I see you know five or six of the Helpa Honda blue shirt guys right, standing out in the middle of the parking lot there, car salesman, looking at the sky. And as I'm walking out, another Honda salesman walked up to me and he goes, check out the UFO. And they were all looking and I turn and I look up to the sky and there was uh, a spinning, uh, I don't know what it was really, it was a spinning way up high in the atmosphere, again, moving very slowly. I don't know if it was a satellite being positioned by the NSA, could have been, because it acted really strange. It moved slowly across the sky, uh, standing in my position to the up, up to the clouds. It moved about three inches in 15 minutes, and it was like going against the wind, very high, so metallic. Very, very slow. And, very slow. Yeah, very, very slow. And it was spinning. You could see every couple of seconds the sun reflect off of it. So it was spinning. And then it stopped and stood there. And then it stopped spinning. 
and stood there and then slowly raised up and then disappeared into the atmosphere. Again, that was about five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, if it was a satellite beam position, very spooky. I didn't know that they could do it like that. That's pretty creepy. If it was, uh, it was definitely a UFO. It was unidentified. We had no idea. The funny thing was about that, Gary, was the one thing that I ask every guest that's on my show. Did you take a picture? <laughs> <laughs> Did you take a picture? You get video? And the response is always, no, I didn't think about it. Well, look, here we had five or six salesmen that all have cell phones, right? Of course, they're sales sure. guys. Yeah, yeah. And all have video. I, so do I. I've got my phone. None of this videotape. We were in awe. Yeah. None of this video. I cannot believe looking back at that, <laughs> I had a 15 or 20 minute opportunity to take out my phone and videotape and I didn't. Okay. So I'm very just, interesting. I'm as guilty. Yeah. yeah and I'm as and guilty when, as when was this? When was this? Oh, uh, last year. Last year. year. Yeah. Okay. So you, you weren't, were you on, you weren't Jimmy Church yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, it was right before the show. Okay, okay. So right. now uh, maybe you'll have your wits about you no matter what happens, right? We, you know, uh, again, <laughs> I'll say it. I totally understand. Clyde Lewis uh, was just up in uh, uh, Tacoma filming a documentary. He's up there with a the film crew. And he's doing a documentary on Maury Island. And after he's done... He, uh, he came on my show and told me the story. It's just hysterical. It's exactly what we're talking about. So that morning, they have a cabin, and they're drinking coffee early in the morning. He's got uh, three, four, five friends in the living room. And right next to the cabin, Bigfoot walks by. Oh, come uh, on. Oh, listen, listen, <laughs> listen. A naked teen wolf is how he described it. It looked like Michael J. Fox in Teen Wolf. No clothes, obviously. Naked, fur covered, but a white face, but long hair. And walked right by, and he yells, there's Bigfoot. And they jump up, they run out of the cabin door, and baby Bigfoot darts off and runs into the woods behind the cabin. And they, they gave chase. They never found it. But they all had cameras. He's up there filming a documentary. Didn't, didn't snap a shot, didn't do anything in the panic and everything that happened. You know, it's just, you're in the moment. I get it. I really do. When somebody says I didn't take a picture, it's nice to have one, but it, it's rare. You know, you remember uh, uh, Carrie and I, uh, Carrie spoke the other day at, um, <laughs> at a seminar, and, and she pulls me up on stage. And one of the things that I asked the audience uh, when we were talking about Malibu, uh, was the, the the sightings that were going on out there. And what happened? The lady in the front row, remember, stood up, I have a video of a, of, of a craft over the Malibu base. We just took it a couple of days ago. It's an amazing video, by the way. That is the rare. That That's rare. That's the exception to the rule. It just doesn't happen. I'm so thankful that her kids who shot the video, it wasn't even her, uh, shot the video that they had their wits about them to go and, and, and grab a shot. Uh, you're so caught up in the moment. And look, if you're if you're watching a bank robbery go down, you're going to watch the bank robbery. You're not going to think about taking out your cell phone. You know. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, moment. but there is every once in a while nowadays, uh, actually, because everyone does have a cell phone. Uh, people are starting to capture those moments, and uh, I, I have to say, you know, I guess I'm ex an exception. I actually I shot. Uh, a video of a of a UFO off off of Malibu off the coast, and that's on my short film for people that have seen it. Uh, it's on my my website uh, under the old. It's in the old part, so you have to go to interviews and scroll down to the old site, old part of the site, and it says short film. Uh, that's the first film I ever shot, and that was I had my camera with me. I pulled up to in the at nighttime on the coast of Malibu, right near the fish place. I don't know if you know that fish place right on the Camera, coast. Uh, 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 Sunset and PCH. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah. no, it's even, it's further. It's, it's, it's actually called the fish place. I mean, it's, it's Oh, the fish place. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it's actually pretty good fish <laughs> free advertisement mm -hmm. here. Uh, but across the street, you know, is the beach. So I, I was just actually, I don't know what I was doing this there. I think I was walking my dog at night. 
and uh, it started to get dark. Actually, it's kind of pretty dark at that point. And um, and I don't know. I saw a flash of something, and I and it and it. What I think that first part is is actually a, a Vandenberg uh, missile or um, something like that. Not sure that part's a UFO. It's all it goes a, sort of in a swirling and it goes straight up. Um, but I saw the flash of light going, and that was going towards Point Doom. So I immediately grabbed my camera, and I took that, and then I also. I don't know what made me do this. I looked, I turned completely in the opposite direction, looking in a complete, you know, going from looking north to looking south with my camera and started shooting the sky. I'm not sure why. I, I Even now, I, 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 I'm i puzzled as to why. What I got at that point was extraordinary, and that is on the short film. Um, what they seem to have been doing, and there's no doubt whatsoever it had to be a UFO, they were drawing, like making pictures, and they actually somehow they made a what looks like a dragon to me. I know it sounds crazy, wow. but on the on the you can look at the shots. They're stills, but they're on the video. So you know it's an in interview. It's the first. It's one of the first things I ever did in Camelot, where I interview Rich Dolan and Jim Mars and put a camera in front of their face and basically said, "Say, have have you ever seen a UFO?" <laughs> Right, right, um, right, right. And, and well, uh, but, but I'm going to turn the interview back on to you. You said that's the first time you've ever shot anything, and you were lucky that you had your camera, right? Okay, well, hold on. Hold well, okay. On. Oh, let's back up. Have you ever seen any other UFOs? Yes, absolutely. And did you, photo and did you photograph <laughs> those? Um, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, no. I mean, no, that's fair enough. But, you know, at a certain point, you know, because, well, I have to remember how many years this was. Um, this was, might have been a little before, because I actually shot the stills maybe before I was actually Camelot. And I did, because back then, I have to say, I did a stupid thing. I called MUFON and, 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 and told him, right? And that's what you did, right? But, right. but nowadays, if I see a UFO, there's no way I call MUFON. Um, now... <laughs> Sorry about that, but guys. But, you know, look, this place is run by the CIA. I know this. I even know this for a fact. I mean, I just, you know, whatever. Um, so, <laughs> so you know, why should I tell those guys something they already know? Um, sorry. But <laughs> okay, okay. I think so, Jan, is, Jan is calling me right now. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so now let's now let's get this back on on track here with you. So okay. So so you've seen this was was three UFOs and that's it. That's all you remember, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, and each one of them was unique, and each one of them I feel strange about. I mean, the the one up in Monterey. Uh, could it have been some crazy satellite anti gravity thing uh, that would that was ours? Yeah, it, it could have been. Uh, but looking at it, it being shaped like a pyramid just kind of freaked me out. I showed it to my uh, my landlord at the time. I was living in Sherman Oaks, and he knocked on my door to change like air conditioning filters or something. At the moment that I had the jeweler's loop on the, the picture, I just got him back uh, from the uh, photo place. So he comes in, and older Armenian guy named Victor, and I said, check this out. And he looks at it. What these these? What these? He, he, he used some very colorful language. <laughs> and 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 it was it's shocking to see something like that up in the clouds where it should just fall out of the sky. It doesn't make any sense. So what that was, I, I really don't know. All I know is what its characteristics were, which were strange, to stop and float. And when it was ripping across the sky, I'm guessing Mach 10, Mach 20, some crazy speed, stop and then shoot straight up into the, in, into the atmosphere. Very strange. The, the globe that we saw in, 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 that landed and crashed in downtown Van Nuys, again, I can't make any sense out of that it would be different for me if it exploded because meteor okay i get that or it had a smoke trail or some kind of vapor trail off of it it didn't have that either as a matter of fact it looked like it didn't really it didn't have a light trail to it it was like a like a a a, a dot a white dot a large one 
Um, and it didn't make any sense. And how it didn't get seen by anybody else, when I know what I saw, I, I, I would never stop and go, am I crazy? No, it wasn't a sighting like that. It wasn't a, a ghost or something where it could be part of your imagination or somebody else speaking to you from the other side. No, this was a, a glow <laughs> flying through the sky in, in, in the valley. Very strange. The other one, the satellite, um, I call it the satellite. I can't really explain that one away either. I don't. I I know that they position satellites, but if they position satellites in broad daylight, I, I would think that we, we would see those all the time. Yeah, you but know? that's kind of low. It, that's pretty low for a satellite. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to to be visible, sure. And yeah. it was uh, like I said that that object was uh, uh, controlled. That was under intelligent control. To see it stop spinning and then uh, just eventually uh, ascend out and then disappear. Yeah, that was pretty creepy. Okay, pretty but, creepy. but let me ask you because, you know, you, you are an intuitive, uh, as I know, Jimmy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I don't know, have you, because, you know, you say your mom was kind of wacko, whatever you want to call that, but in a good sure. way. Sure. Um, so you were already aware of sort of the other side of things, yes. the unseen yes. world, so to speak. So Absolutely. did you ever have abduction scenarios in your youth? Uh, no, I had one as an adult, okay. oddly enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. We, we, uh, let's, not, uh, let's not call it abduction yet. I did have a, a very contact. strange... How about contact? Yeah, yeah. I had a very strange... Um, uh, sleep paralysis episode with something in my room, and this happened. I, I was uh, I was living alone in Sherman Oaks, oddly enough, across the street from coast to coast. If you know that area, you know where uh, uh, Premier broadcasts from. So right so. there, I had a con uh, a condo on Dickens, and uh, I always slept in the dark. After this evening, I slept with. The lights on for <laughs> until today. I still do. Um, so this is what happened. I woke up. I was sleeping on my back, and my bedroom was your conventional bachelor pad. In that bed, two nightstands at the foot of my bed, TV, stereo, uh, and then two speakers on speaker stands uh, that were about twelve feet apart. The one speaker stand was in the corner of the bedroom uh, with a, a speaker on the top of it. And the speaker stand, three feet tall, right? Four feet tall. Okay. So that's the setup. I'm on my back, and I wake up. My eyes pop open, and my chest is pounding. And I'm freaking out. I don't know if I'm having a heart attack or what, but my adrenaline is rushing through my body. And I went to move and I couldn't, couldn't move. All I could move was my eyeballs. Now my head was propped up a little bit on the pillow and I'm trying to look around the room in the dark, a uh, semi dark, you know, it wasn't pitch black, but trying to look around the room and I felt somebody in the room with me and I couldn't move and I couldn't see. And I, and, and I started to go into more of a panic, hyperventilating. I'm freaking out. I can't move. Uh, I can't move my head. I can only move my eyes. And I try to look down uh, to the foot of the bed where I felt somebody standing there. And I could see in the corner of the room next to the speaker, somebody standing there. And like behind the speaker, I, I, maybe trying to hide. I'm still not sure, but definitely standing over in the corner of the room looking at me. And that just, now I go into full <laughs> panic mode. And and this goes on. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Can you describe that so-called person? Was was it like a short being, like a gray type thing or yeah, what? You know, that's the vibe that I got. I couldn't focus, I couldn't move my eyes. Uh, imagine yourself lying flat on your back and you can't move and you're trying to look at your feet. Okay, it's <laughs> it's impossible to do. But I was trying to move the best that I could to see the, this thing. Now, it was a little bit taller than my speakers. I could see his head. It looked like it was a larger head than should be on the body. 
The body looked a little thin, but it was also all dark and shadowy. So I couldn't really make out any real details, but I could definitely tell that it was, I, I was waiting for this thing to speak to me. You know, like, I don't know if I was being robbed. You know, I don't know if this, you know, I don't know. I didn't know what was going on, but there was definitely somebody there. And uh, this, this lasted for about 15 minutes. And finally, something released off of me and I couldn't move. And I immediately, I didn't look to see what was in the corner of the room. I flipped over and turned on my lamp that was on the nightstand. And I turned and looked, and nobody was there. And I jumped up out of bed. I turned on every light in the house. And it took me hours to calm down. Hours, <laughs> hours. And I never slept with the lights off after that or the TV. I slept uh, to this day. I have something on. I cannot deal with sleeping in the dark. Okay, now, how? Uh, what, what, what year was that? Uh, 90, 97, 98. Okay. All right. Well, uh, yeah, so uh, that's interesting. Uh, but you don't recall anything as a, as a child. As a child, no. Uh, in that, uh, not not specifically something like that. What what happened to me a lot as a child was uh, deja vu at a very young age, and it was something that I was cognizant of and very aware of at a very young age. It would happen to me all the time. Couldn't explain it. Um, my mom, when I would talk to her about things like that, ah, that's deja vu, whatever. You know, my mom was hip to that. You know, so, uh, but deja vu was something that happened to me and still does to this day. Yeah. But when I, when I was five, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, it was something that I expected nearly on a daily basis. And deja vu was strange. And another thing that would happen to me at a very young age doesn't happen at all, uh, probably stopped when I was eight or nine years old was uh, while I was sleeping, my body would go through, uh, the best way I can explain it is like an electric shock. It would, it would be this thing that would zzzz, and I would feel it throughout my whole body, and I would wake up. And, and it would happen when I was sleeping. And it would also happen on, and I, I figured this out at a very young age, on Sunday morning. Sunday mornings, I would... I would be up with my brothers and sisters watching television. There were no cartoons on Sunday mornings. You know, it was boring TV. Cool TV happened on Saturday mornings. I get my vibe. So I would be up 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning and with my brothers and sisters goofing around eating cereal, and it would happen on Sundays. And then it stopped. And I, I never could explain that away, and, and, and it doesn't happen as an adult. And it would last for five or ten seconds. Interesting. So, it, yeah. yeah, it was very strange. And it would seem like it would be the onset of some crazy deja vu. You know, now, again, uh, not as an adult. It doesn't hit me as an adult. But uh, I've, I've heard similar stories from other uh you know, other people and researchers over the years. Um, I, I, I can't make the connection as an adult, but it certainly happened often uh, when I was a kid. Okay, very interesting. All right, well, uh, thank you for that. And I, I'm sure that people, you know, I, some people will have maybe heard some of those stories, but uh, I think uh, they'll find it valuable because people kind of want to know where you're coming from as even as a talk show host. And um, since you're relatively new, at least to the circuit, in the sense of being well known, um, you know it's 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 cool to for people to hear. Uh, so okay, now you have your father. Are your parents alive now? Or yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. So your father was definitely military, although mm -hmm. he worked. You know, he he was in the band, right? Yeah, never shot a gun. Uh huh. Not that I know of. Yeah. No, he he was a musician. Okay. So, so let's talk about this, uh, you know, fade to black, because you, you basically came on board. Uh, it, I don't know how art, how they select you. I mean, how did art select you? Did you apply for this thing or did, did they, you get picked out of a hat or what happened? Yeah, we kind of found each other um, about, 
uh, I was getting a little fed up, not not only with the sports scene, but I think myself, I wasn't I wasn't uh, happy. Um, so we decided to about three months before left uh, Art left the air, we decided to change our format, and the new show was the old show was called the Revolution, the sports show, and we were going to call the new show Jimmy Church Against the World. Okay, and. <laughs> I was going to take on all comers, anything, fringe science, ufology, paranormal, NWO, Illuminati, bring it. Um, I am going to challenge the orthodox out there, the orthodoxy, and and I was going to bring it full steam. And that that was it. And I was I was like I said, I was a bit angry at how mass media, which I was part of was treating things that I knew, I knew, I felt not only in my bones, but with the evidence out there, that something is going on, on all levels, whether it is Iraq and Afghanistan and the military, or ufology and UFOs and sightings and ETs and Area 51, and paranormal research and lost civilizations and 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 Egypt and Peru, and, and, and just, just things were just making me very, very angry. And I wanted to get it out there full tilt. There were other programs uh, uh, going on, but I'm not going to name names. I, I won't do it. Some of them are friends. But but that fell short. And it, it really was starting to uh, uh, to piss me off. So I thought, if, if I'm going to do this, if we're going to make the change, then I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to bring on all of the people that I respect, and I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out really what's going on. I'm going to bring on the people that I don't respect, and I'm going to find out what's going on, and that's it, and I'm not going to hold back. And that's, uh, I, I was, the frustration that's out there, not only, and, and, and Carrie, you've been doing this for a long time, and you know how much I respect you, okay? And so <laughs> the pat on the back is over, but you know exactly what I'm talking about here. And and it is so frustrating to whether you believe something or not. That's not even the point. The point is, what is the truth? You may not even want to believe the truth. So it's not about your belief. It's about what you're being told. And and the opportunity uh, to come on. I learned it in sports. I learned that I could uh, not only with Sandusky, which we're not going to go into, but the way that the mass media treats things. Um, and they're forced into uh, treating subjects. And when I say treats, I'm talking about treatment. The way that they treat things uh, is wrong. And and what you are getting is filtered. Is it 50% of the truth? I You know, today, looking back as an adult, I'm close to saying 0% of the truth. You know, 5%. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and that's a scary thought. Yeah. So when when I have a guest on my show, uh, it, it is it's a platform not only for the guest but for myself to get to the bottom line unfiltered. A lot of shows say that oh we ask the questions nobody else will ask. You know what? No, you don't. <laughs> you, you think you do. You don't. And I don't care if it's uh, something on cable. Or something on the internet. Okay? I know when I listen to stuff, I'm only getting half. And and that's why this show, part of the success of the show is uh, everybody knows that when they come and listen to Jimmy Church and the guests, and the guests know this going in, that uh, I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to be rude. No. I'm not going to be mean. I'm not going to paint somebody into a corner. I'm not going to expose somebody. No, that's not what I'm not Howard Stern. I don't care about being a shock jock. I care about learning. And if I can if I if I can sit and have a conversation with somebody just like you and I talk on the phone every single day when we talk um, to to get uh, to get back to the audience, what I'm trying to get out of the guests. If I can just do that in an unfiltered way so the audience knows there's no editing, there's no censoring, and I'm asking the questions that the audience has always wanted to ask that guest. 
And if I can pull that off, I've succeeded. And, and, and that's it. Okay. But now let's get back to the question because I still want to know how you found or Art Bell found you. And you say when he, he was about to go oh. off the air. What do oh. you mean? Because he was about to go off the air several times. And the latest <laughs> of foray we know was on Sirius, which was very right. short-lived and uh, has re resulted, as far as I know, in a, in a lawsuit that's kept him off the air. So, right. so, if, so when are we talking about and how did the logistics okay. happen? Yeah, yeah, sorry. You know, I hate it when guests do that, and I just put it to you. <laughs> no, I'm glad I that guess, you, no, you it's, no, it's all good because you just said some really important things, and, and people got a, a real look at, at who you are. But, uh, you know, just to get back to this part of the question. <laughs> just answer the question, Church. No. Oh. Um, it, it, this is what happened. Uh, I, like everybody else, one day I'm surfing, Art Bell's coming back on the air today. What? You know, and I click, and I'm listening, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Art's back. This is great. Wow. Oh, I'm whole again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and, uh, and, and I, but I was also in a really, oh, crap moment because we were gearing up to launch my new show. Uh, and I thought, no, I don't want to compete against Art. No, <laughs> everybody else that I can compete against, that's easy. That's easy fodder. That's going to be easy. But I can't go up against art. This was bumming me out. And we decided not to change our plans. We were still going to go for it. And then three months later, well, no, it was October, November, a uh, month and a half, six weeks, art leaves the air. And now you never really want to... Uh, uh, achieve something from somebody else's unsuccess. You know, that's that's not cool. But I gave it like two days. <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to make sure he was really off in the air. <laughs> oh, God. And, and uh, as morose as that may sound, um, I wasn't going to go and, and contact Art and Keith um well, you, you know, he, his body was still warm. You know, that's not that's not right. I just wanted to make sure that everything was going down like we thought it was, that he was indeed leaving the air. And then when Coast to Coast had taken over Art's slot on, on Sirius, like two days later, I was like, holy crap, this is real. Okay, this is not a bridge that can be mended. Art is off of the air. So uh, I wrote Keith. I immediately contacted Keith, and uh, Keith uh, called me that day. And I said, look, you've never heard of me, but, <laughs> okay, I, I, I've got a show. We were going to launch it anyway. Here's my website. This is my sports stuff. Go look at all of this. Go look at the videos. Go look at how I treat this, um, and, and go look at all of the past episodes and see who I am. Uh, and I promise you that the way that I treat sports is how I, I will be approaching the paranormal. Now, you can either join up with me or you're going to go against me. It's, it's it, you know, because I, we're going to launch this anyway. And he said uh, he listened uh, and literally, uh, I think it was either that afternoon or the next morning, they called me back and said, uh, are you ready to go on the air on Thursday? And that was like on Wednesday. And I said, yeah, let's do it. And that's how it happened. Wow. So, uh, but did you have a conversation with Art? Everyone wants to know that, you know? Ah, uh, everybody wants to know. All that's private. All that's private. All communication. Can you just say you had a conversation with the guy? I mean, you can say that, right? All, you have, all... I know, I, look, I know, I'm going to say, it. I know <laughs> for a fact you've talked to Art Bell. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's pretty look, cool. It, isn't it cool in itself? Come on, was that the first time you ever talked to him? Uh, uh, Carrie, I've never, <laughs> I, I've never spoken to Art Bell. Never. Let's just, start, let's just look. Uh, all of that stuff. Um, the way I, I respect uh, Keith and Art and their model and how they are approaching things. Keith and Art want silence, and that's what they want. Now, uh, Art will be back on the air July fifteenth. Uh, I, I think that's the date. Uh, that's the date that he can go back on the air. I'll, I'll, put, uh, I'll say that. 
Now, um, I have uh, asked Art many times uh, via email to come on my show. And I, and I used to do it once a week. It was just out of, <laughs> just like, okay, hey, Art, here's the email this week. Are you coming on the air? He, uh, he, he loves the show. I know that. I can say that. Uh, does he listen to the show? Sure he does. He, uh, this is his network. He and Keith's network. And, and we are gearing up and building the audience and everything and getting ready. There's a lot of technical things that need to be in place when Art comes on the air and comes back. Um, Art has agreed uh, to let me keep my time slot, which is 7 to 10, and he will be on after me going directly against Coast to Coast. So, um, and all of those communications, that the stuff that I'm telling you is the stuff that uh, uh, I'm allowed to say. Okay. Other stuff, I mean, it's not my network, you know? I'm just the anchor show on, on the network. That's it. So... Uh, and I'm privileged to have that. But other than that, I have nothing to do with programming. I have nothing to do with decisions or or anything. Well, well just... no, let's let's drill down just a little bit here. Okay, so Coast to Coast and, uh, you know, and uh, your show are all owned by, uh, well, I don't know if they're all owned by Premier, but they're all owned by Clear Channel. Not my show. How does that work? Uh, I own everything. Well, Rita. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, that's that. Just like any other uh, uh, radio program or television show, you have a production company that owns that show and it is picked up by a network. So that is the situation with uh, uh, Dark Matter Radio and, and Jimmy Church Radio. Okay, so... We are two separate entities. Um, anything that goes on on my show is uh, my decision. Well, our decision, uh, Rita and myself. Okay. So, um, and yeah, we discussed with the producers here, and we we do we do stuff, but very little is done by committee. It's uh, it's all me. So, okay, <laughs> but 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 you are working with uh, Art Bell's network, or yes. however you want to look at it, right? So it's right, got to be uh, sort of a, I don't know, um, something has to be mutually agreed on in theory. You probably signed a, a, a contract, right? And who pays you? They pay you, right? Or they buy the shows? What goes on? All that is private. <laughs> I love you, Carrie. I but know. All that, yeah, everybody wants to know how, uh, how this is funded. And, you, you know, to to do all of this, they, you know, obviously uh, there's money coming from someone. OK, but 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 it's not the CIA. <laughs> it's not a, <laughs> it's it's not the government. It's not anything there. Um, we've kept we've kept everything private for a lot of reasons. Uh, the funding of the show, how how I'm paid, how the show is paid, how how the show succeeds and everything, everything. All the web and that, that there's a huge amount of money that is involved here. Yes, there is. It's it's obvious. It doesn't happen by itself. I work eight days a week, twenty four hours a day for this show. It gets funded from somewhere. But the the best way to approach all of this is the funding is kept private. Therefore, nobody, uh, not only listeners but uh, mass media or anything else. They can't go and speak to any funding sources um, or talk any smack. Also, uh, those funding sources uh, allow me to speak freely. So I'm not uh, influenced by, I'm not worried about where the money's coming from because I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to interview the wrong person. I'm going to talk about the NSA. I'm going to talk about okay, Obama. Okay, well, let's, okay, let's do a comparison then. Uh, coast to Coast, George Nori. Yeah. Okay, now I happen to know who runs those that show, and mm -hmm. it is the CIA, and um, I'm sure that this is going <laughs> to endear me. <laughs> Didn't mean to make you uh, choke on your coffee. <laughs> and um, no, I have this is my back channel information. You know what the hell? Uh, you know, okay. so so okay, so somebody's funding their show, and it's I guess what is it? Premier Network, and you're you're on Premier Net. Is that right? You're is this no, part no, of the Premier? No, no, no. Two two, se two two separate situations. Uh, Premier, which is now called iHeartRadio, 
Okay. Clear Channel is now called iHeartRadio. They made the changes uh, last week, the week before. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, just okay. a, it's just one step away from Pure Heart Investments. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole other <laughs> Yeah, world. right, right, right. Yeah. All so, right, fine. But but that that is completely Obviously, I'm separate. never going to appear on this. <laughs> yeah. No, that is completely, okay. completely separate. A lot of, I, I don't know why uh, everybody out there, and I get, I get so much, uh, so much uh, uh, correspondence about this, that they think that everybody is involved in this together. Okay? Coast to Coast, Art Bell, Keith Rowland, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, uh, we're all in this together. Um, no, we are not. Um, but uh, I, I got an email from somebody the other day that saying that uh, Premier Radio and Coast to Coast own Dark Matter Radio's website. And I said, really? Okay, I, don't, I know nothing about that. Well, all you got to do is search. You can search. And the owner of it, well, I don't, you know, I don't know who owns ArtBell.com. I, I really don't. I don't know who owns DarkMatterRadio.net. I know who owns JimmyChurchRadio.com. And I know that what my relationship is, I don't have any connections directly to them. Do they call me? Sure. Are George and I friends? Yes. Uh, do we talk? Sure. Has he called into my show? Yes. Have I been on his show? Yes. Are there pictures of us together out there in public? Yes. There's no dark cabal on my side. If, if it's there, it's, it, it's, it's on their side. And I really honestly... Uh, I uh, know nothing about it. I really okay. don't. I, Fair look, enough. I have, I have said many times to people inside of our organization, dude, if I find out that this conversation gets to the other side, you know, I know where it came from. I need to be very aware of that. I don't need a phone call uh, from the other side, whether it's, you know, not only Art or Keith or, or anybody over at Coast to Coast or George or the head of Premier and rumors have started or things are out there. I, I don't need that. But um, uh, I'm, I'm very aware of that. I'm very aware. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Fair enough. Well, you know, I had to lay all that out there for people because they're curious. They're, they're, they ask. They ask. I, I get it. You no, know, it's okay. No, I mean, you know, there is sort of a, a, a thing going on because in a sense uh, they're going to sort of, um, let me say, try to own the airways in, in whichever way they can they can manage it. And uh, if they've got a, 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 you know, if your kind of your relationship is production company to network, um, that's got to be, you know, that's a pretty cozy relationship. And that's something that they've got a vested interest in, which is seeing the success of your show. Um, mm -hmm. That helps you. And, uh, you know, so that's that's important. Uh, but look, I mean, you are a breath of fresh air. Um, it's nice to talk to somebody who really knows their stuff like you. Uh, for me, it's nice to, 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 to have a compatriot out there who, who basically kind of gets it. And, um, and that's hard and that's rare. And, uh, you know, that's not to even, well, I'm not bad mouthing George Norrie either because I think George Norrie knows his stuff. George Norrie as an individual is a different matter <laughs> A different dark matter than the whole rest of the the scenario. You know what I'm saying? In other words, right. I'm not having an issue with him personally. Um, this is not personal. So we're just talking about companies and who companies that own other companies, and you know, following that kind of rabbit hole back. And this is how media sort of entities get sort of managed. But in your case, I mean, you're you're obviously you've kind of demarcated your your position, your sort of area, your territory, and and at least for the time being, you're you're out there, and you're free well, to say and do as you say, what you want, right? And to have well, on as a guest somebody that you prefer or or you want to have on, um, you know, because this is the kind of thing that we're up against. We're up against, as you know, I mean, you you know, you don't have blinders on um, the the major media being you know bought and paid for for all intents and purposes. With this, we started the conversation, at least this part of it talking about how they are uh, not letting the truth out and that they're massaging well, the message. Yes, and, and this, is, this is one of the most important points that uh, needs to be driven home. And these are, it's called hard facts. These are the facts of the situation. Coast to coast, not only coast to coast, 
but all radio, all AM radio, talk radio, uh, has uh, seen a very severe drop in numbers. Okay? Now, we all know about Art Bell's heyday, 25 million listeners a night. That is, it's, it's insane to think <laughs> about the influence that he could influence a tenth of the population every single night. He could have overthrown Washington, D.C. Okay, all right, <laughs> tomorrow, everybody, let's meet on Pennsylvania Avenue. We're going to burn that house down. And it would have happened. Okay? It's not that kind of party anymore, Carrie. The decline in numbers, um, uh, uh, one of the uh, um, AM 940 here in Los Angeles just switched formats. They're no longer news radio. Okay? They're, it's ABC. They're, they, they switch to sports. And their, their numbers went from being a million a week, which is significant, to 75,000 a week. Okay? My numbers are way higher than that per day. Okay? Now, Coast to Coast has gone through, and you can look at all of these Arbitron numbers yourself. This sure. is public stuff. They've gone from 25 million a night to weekdays uh, with our 20 million a night, you know, pick a year, to 300,000 a night. So where the, the pie doesn't shrink, the pie doesn't grow, the pie is the same. The same audience is listening. They're just listening and getting their fix from other sources. Sure. Okay? And that's what's important here. So what, who, why is Coast to Coast numbers going down? Or other shows like that. Why? It could be talk radio. It doesn't matter. They're listening to talk radio on the Internet. They're listening to alternative news sources. They can go to Pandora. They can, they can go to other sources now and get their fix, whether it's music, talk, or whatever. Sure. Now, the, this show, Coast to Coast knows, or any other network knows, their numbers are going down, but our numbers are going up. Okay? It's not that the pie is, is moving, you know, growing or shrinking. The audience size is the same. It's where are they getting the fix from? And they recognize that. You know, when I was on Coast to Coast the other night, uh, George said, hey, hey, you want to take some calls? Yeah, let's take some calls. Guy comes on the air. Hey, Jimmy, man, love the show. When are you going to be back on Sirius? Do you think George wanted to hear that? Or, or you know, we're talking about an internet show. We weren't supposed to be significant. The internet. <laughs> not, not only my show, but show, you know, the internet in general. And now uh, the, the influence of what's going on with the internet is extreme. Now, yes. either they join the party or, you know, and, and you've got to figure out a way to, to mesh the boat. Would, um, would a network approach us, you know, like Premier or Westwood One or CBS, Cumulus, and would, would they approach us? I will not. Uh, this conversation has come up a lot. I won't do it. I what do you mean it. you won't do it? I, what won't you do? I'm not going to give up what we have built uh, on Fade to Black. Uh, it, you can go and look at so many different other... It, the reason why, the reason why I, can't, I cannot be controlled. And I know that when you and I are sitting in my studio, right, doing an interview... I don't have to worry about a station manager crashing through the door saying, you can't talk to Kerry about the NSA like this. Okay? The FCC is <laughs> going to shut us down. You need to stop. Advertisers are going to start pulling their money. I don't have to worry about that. I have that freedom. And it will always be that. I, there's no way that uh, I, I could be lassoed and, and silenced and filtered because... I have fun every single night. I know that I can ask the questions that I want to ask and not have repercussions. And, and it's not about the threat of the big guy coming in. It's about my heart. I'm happy. After every show, I'm happy. I feel good. You know, <laughs> I, I don't want to end a, I would hate to end the show bummed out. 
yeah. because Absolutely. I was roped and, and, and lassoed and, and silenced. So I think that's very, very important. The Internet now today, it's a different kind of party. Uh, streaming, like what you and I are doing right now, we're video streaming. We couldn't do this 10 years ago. Right. Okay. And not, not, not for an audience to have fun. An audience would uh, grow bored at watching something skip and audio drop and it just didn't sound right and it's not okay. Now we can do this, you know, right now. We are, we are live around the world without restraint. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm filtering my language, <laughs> but I'm not <laughs> filtering thought. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, and, and that's great. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow for questions. Uh, now I'm looking at the time. So we've been going for a little over an hour and, uh, you've got a show tonight. So I'm going to give you some leeway also as to when we close this down, but but, you know, I have more questions to ask you, obviously, more places to go. We want to talk a little bit, at least for a short while. I know that maybe you beat this, the horse, <laughs> the underground base off of Malibu uh, to death at this point. But there may be a few new developments that you can at least talk about. And I'd like to go down that, that road. Um, sure. There may be a few other places we can go as well. So, uh, so, so if you're willing. Uh, yeah, let's, let's go. Let's go. Okay. All right, so, so, but we want to watch the time, and we're going to stay under two hours here. So we definitely will we'll, we'll end this thing around 2 o'clock, just so people have a, a ballpark. Um, but basically, uh, let, let's talk about the underground base, because when you came on, on, I was actually speaking at, uh, we had a small seminar, myself and Sean David Morton. Um, Conscious Life Expo does some seminar series every once in a while as a lead up to their actual February uh, event. So, so we had a, a seminar at the, uh, off of, you know, the Hilton in the normal place. Um, and I had Jimmy, Jimmy as, as my special secret guest <laughs> at the end of the show um, there. And you, you did mention a few updates on, on what was going on with the underground base. So let's, let's go there. What, what's new? What's uh, okay, well, let, let me back up uh, when I, I want to say a few things about that. And I think that uh, I'm, I'm talking about the Conscious Life uh, seminar. Um, I think for you and all of us, when I stepped up to the mic and I turned to the audience, first off, uh, to hear um, everybody's applause when you mentioned me said a lot because I'm not sure who listens to the show. But that whole room knew. And, 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 and I'm, what I'm saying by that is that's, that's the importance of the Internet and Internet radio. People listen now. And, and to get that reaction out of everybody, you remember when I stepped up and I go, oh, you guys know who I am. That was the first thing I said. <laughs> and, and for them to go, yeah, it was, uh, I was like, okay, now I'm, I'm a little more comfortable. But, but that's the influence of the Internet that I was just talking about. And that is very important. And the second thing that I did, and this was an eye opener, not only for me, but I think for you, too. When I said to the room, OK, who knows about the Malibu deep underwater base? Every hand in that room shot up. Yeah. Everyone. Now, that is um, it's shocking. Uh, uh, years ago, it would have taken so long for things to get, you know, feet and to get momentum and to get the word out. Uh, not, it's not, it's not the case anymore. And so, for everybody to know exactly what I was about to speak about, spoke volumes. Not only about who is attending the Conscious Life Expo, who your friends are, and and so forth. People are aware, and it is, it's just, it, it's great. It makes yes. it easy for me. So now, uh, as far as the updates go, the updates are are general in that we will be uh, putting together DVD and doing uh, the underwater uh, stuff here very soon. And we are working on that. And we are very, very close. So the logistics of, of such an adventure are not. We're not going up into the mountains with video cameras to shoot, you know, uh, <laughs> UFOs in the sky. That's not what, you know, we have to have a large boat. We have to have a crew that uh, handles the underwater uh, stuff. We have to have a documentary crew. We have to have a boat captain. We have to have all of these logistics have to be put into play um, uh, before we do that. It's not easy. Uh, 
the money side of it, it, it that's okay. Uh, that 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 is taken care of. But it's it's just the logistics of getting it all together, right place at the right time. So that being said, what I can talk about is originally. The way that the mass media dealt with this, part of it was my mistake. Um, I, uh, I announced a bunch of research that uh, at that time we thought uh, was accurate. Everything that we presented originally uh, about the depth and the size and the distance was all from uh, government websites and Google Earth. Okay? Now, you have to deem most of that as accurate. Because it's it's our Earth. We're not talking about a so- solar system. We're talking about Malibu, California. But um, so the original depth that we had on it was about 2,000 feet, which makes things logistically very difficult to get to. You can't dive to it, first off. You can't just jump off the boat and swim to it. Um, you can't do that. Also, the s- submarines and submersibles that get to that depth are rare. They're out there but they're rare and they're expensive. So uh, we were up against all of that. But the original analysis that we presented to everybody also said that it was too deep to be man-made. In other words, uh, during the last, you know, last ice age, it was still underwater. And that was the first thing that John Anthony West said. He said, Jimmy, it was underwater 10,000 years ago. That's what I want to know. Well, <laughs> So, which made sense. And so it got poo-pooed by the mainstream media. Um, Huffington Post did their article, and uh, it's too deep, it's, it's this, and, and everybody wanted to shoot it down. Well, uh, about two weeks after uh, ABC News did their thing on it, and uh, Huffington Post did their article, we, we uh, got a bunch of uh, new analysis and topography studies. And which now show the base at 150 feet under the water. And that is very, very, very important. Why? Previous ocean levels, last ice age, clearly puts this base above water. Possibly even on dry land. Now we've got a different situation here. And had we presented stuff to the mass media back then, like that, John Anthony West would have come to a different conclusion. He's a friend of mine. I'm not saying any. I, I'm the one that gave him the data. Okay, so that's my fault. Um, this data that was presented when I spoke to uh, the NSGS and, and, and other uh, government organizations, was a diff- it was wrong. It was incorrect data. Now this base, whatever it is, was uh, clearly above sea level 10,000 years ago. Who was here 10,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, could this be uh, a parking lot for USOs? Absolutely. Could it be a parking lot for Navy submarines? Absolutely. Could it uh, uh, allow access inland? Absolutely. There have been rumors about this for so long now that uh, to finally have something that that could be exactly this is is exciting. I think that the fact that it was above uh, uh, above sea level 10,000, 12,000 years ago and beyond is very, very important, and that is a game changer. Okay. Uh, actually, while I'm talking to you, you're, while you're talking, I, I was just looking for some some photos here, and I just got them up on the screen for the people. I don't know if there's anyone who's not heard about this, but you know, whatever. It's now uh, it's now on the screen, so people can actually see that, that what's been on Google Maps. Now, there was, uh, as we talked about at at my th- that small conference, uh, basically there has been some um, Google Maps covered it up or some part of it, and then you have to drill down and sit, remove the water or something like that. You want to explain uh, that? Yeah. For everybody that goes out to the coordinates, uh, there is a little box that you check, remove water. And that's what you want to do. And that'll that'll get rid of the clouding that is intentionally put in front, right in front of the base. It's kind of funny. But uh, if you have the right version of uh, Google Earth, you'll see that checkbox there. I get, <laughs> excuse me, I get email every single day. Dude, they clouded over the base. I knew it. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, yeah, it's just uh, 
click on the box and that will remove the water and, and then you can see it. Okay, very good. Uh, so as far as, um, now you did see, um, you said you were out there photographing uh, in a helicopter or something and, uh, and there was a boat. Yep. Uh, right yep. over the right over the, the area of the base, doing something. Yeah, right over. Yeah, right over the entrance of the base. Now, the base itself is two and a half miles uh, by one and a half miles uh, on the top. Uh, that's very, very, very large. When you're on the open ocean, a mile in one direction or a mile in the other direction is you know it's 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 a lot of distance. And so when we flew out uh, with our video cameras over the base, uh, we had in our GPS and in, in, inside the uh, cockpit, the entrance of the base was our waypoint. That's where we were flying to. And so as we are approaching the base, now we, at, at that point, we are actually flying over the base. Uh, like I said, it's two and a half miles by one and a half miles. And we're approaching the waypoint, and I could see that on the GPS. And I knew we were getting, getting ready to fly right over the entrance. In other words, right in between the two pillars, right? And uh, that's when the pilot said, Jimmy, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? What is that right there? And, and I looked down at the GPS. We're now right over the X. And I look out the window, and there's a dive boat right there, right underneath our plane. Uh, and as far as you know, it wasn't owned by James Cameron. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah. uh, we contacted Cameron, and uh, he said that his uh, submarine has now been uh, pil pilfered for parts. But uh, So we circle this boat. You know, I say boat. Um, I'm going uh, to guess from our altitude, I'm going to say it was about 100 foot. You know, it was, it was significant, a ship, if you will. It looked like it was uh, a catamaran, uh, just a massive uh, uh, ocean research vessel. That's what it looked, you know, looked like to me. And uh, so we circled it, and we could see uh, on one side of the boat that there were a couple of divers off to the side of the boat, and 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 uh, uh, people were assisting them. And you could see that there was a crowd on that side of the boat; and they were doing something. Um, we circled well, we circled it for about 15 minutes. I'm sure that we freaked him out pretty good. Uh, well, <laughs> that must have been fun. Uh, but at any rate, I have had somebody say that there are, you know, there's a limit to how deep you can go when you dive. Yes. And, uh, and, and that perhaps this might be too deep. Is that possible? Well, dive as a, as a diver, like in a wetsuit. Yeah. You're, li you're limited to 100 feet. You know, uh, extreme certifications. I don't know the exact specifics on this. I'm not uh, an expert. But 150 feet is about max. I mean, that's like death. Okay, compression and everything. Okay, so this is deeper than that, isn't it? Well, the top of the base is about 150 feet down. So could a diver dive and get to the top of this platform? Yes. Could a dive, those divers that I'm talking about, or what they were doing out there, I don't know if that was a government uh, vessel. I don't know if they had ROVs in the water. I don't know if they were dropping video cameras down there. I don't, I, I, I really, I don't know. Uh, I tried to read numbers on the boat. I tried to get, uh, I zoomed in. Uh, the video was inconclusive. You really can't see anything. Again, we're on a, we weren't on a helicopter. We were in an airplane. So we're always moving forward. And, it's not like we could stay steady and, sure. and get it close. We couldn't do it. Well, uh, but what I actually, I was referencing the idea that if you're going out there, are you taking divers? And if you're taking divers, are they planning to, you know, take cameras underwater and go down yeah, and we're dive using down? Our, yeah, ROVs, remote operated vehicles. Oh, okay. So, and those will have cameras on them. And how and deep they can be, they go? They can go 3,500 feet. Okay. So they could yeah, actually they could they could drive inside. The, I, well, they'll be on cables, but that is uh, um, uh, the answer. The short answer is yes, but I don't want to give away too much here. <laughs> I don't want to let I don't want the other side to know what we're up to. Okay, no problem. Uh, well, I, I think that that's good for people because they're gonna they're gonna be envisioning uh, this this, and that's a pretty exciting event. Uh, 
Can Tell you see me. my coffee cup? Can you see what it says? <laughs> Question everything. Oh, God, that's what I love to say. Okay, very cool. It's pretty yeah. badass, isn't it? Yeah, excellent. Uh, all right, so... So in terms of what's going on, Jimmy, uh, is there anything else that, you, you know, kind of you, this is your, you know, normally you're on with somebody and it's their sort of, they're on stage, right? And you're the, the sort of, uh, you know, the host, whatever, that's fine. We're on stage too when we're hosts, but this is, the focus is on you. The spotlight is on you. So what do you want to talk about? What, what's on your mind lately? How do you look at the world? What do you, you know, do you have an ish, a big issue with something uh, you want to talk about? Something that hasn't been noticed? Something that you're well, really, you think is a really hot topic? Yeah, you know, uh, right now, I feel, I feel like the media and the government and the world in general um, is, is in flux. There's something going on right now. I had on uh, L.A. last night, Marzulli on the show, and... He's really, he's like the end of times prophet guy right now. You know, we're, <laughs> we're right here, man. I'm, I'm, I got my bags packed and it's, it's going down any day. And although I don't, I'm not quite there yet, but do I have a bug out pack and water stored in the house? I just might. Um, uh, do I have ammunition? I'm not going there, but uh, things, things are kind of trippy right now. And so I had said the other day on the air, is today any different than the way the tension we felt on the morning of 9-11 or the day after 9-11? That was a pretty crazy time, wasn't it? Like, okay, pretty crazy. We were looking at the world. Oh, man, we have Saddam Hussein. We've got Al-Qaeda. We've got New York is falling down and... And, and planes are crashing around the United States and then the Pentagon and is L.A. next. And, you know, it was, you know, that was a pretty trying time for all of us. But if you back up a few years behind that was uh, were, were things as crazy. It seems like we could point to any any day, go back all the way to Vietnam, go back to Vietnam. Those are crazy times. You know, the world was changing right in front of us. We had the black-white racism thing that we we're coming out of and segregation out of the 60s with uh, Vietnam going down and, and, and uh, you know, and going into the 70s. Those were, those were trying times, too. Was, was the world as crazy as it is today? Well, I would venture to say that, um, you know, when we had Reagan in office, love that guy to death. You know, love him to death, but he was a crazy dude. We never knew if he was going to flip the switch and start banging missiles at, at China and Russia at, at the drop of a hat. We're in the middle of the Cold War. So we always had that tension above us. And, and so with today, uh, looking at uh, not only ISIS and Iraq and North Korea, but MH17 and MH370 and some of those crazy situations and Sandy Hook and and is that real or not? And is is the media lying to us right now, right now about something? It seems like they're doing it all day long. Now we throw Ebola into the mix and we've gone through this uh, news cycle over the last. Let's go back six months. Let's go back to MH370. OK, when that plane disappeared, we've gone through these really weird news cycles throw in Ferguson, you know, and all the, all these really like seminal events have been going on overlapping the previous news, uh, uh, of the previous day, which was some earth shattering catastrophic news. MH370 was a big deal. It just disappeared and they still haven't found. <laughs> we managed to find the Titanic, but we can't find, you know, in 20,000 feet of water, but we can't find a plane with electronic surveillance and GPS uh, uh, all over it, but it just falls out of the sky. We can't track it with radar. When you, it flew through uh, one of the most craziest war zones, you know, Vietnam and everything else, where you know Pakistan and India and Australia and uh, Malaysia all have radar, 
to, to spot any, a, 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 a bird flying across the border so they can shoot it out of the sky, but they can't follow an airplane. So following that news cycle to today, I would say that we're in a very strange situation. And, and mass media today, if we've ever had proof, proof as citizens that we're being lied to, let's look at the last six months. Let's look at this. Was MH370 treated correctly by the media? And are we being told the truth by our, our, our own government? Absolutely not. 100% fabricated BS has been pushed down our throats. Okay, okay, but let's stop everything right here because, you know, people are, I, I don't know, for people that don't know you, look, you know 9-11 is an inside job. This is a given, all right? So am I talking to somebody who knows 9-11 is an inside job or are you one of those people who has no idea or, you know, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt here. Right, right, right. Well, Sandy Hook and 9-11 are two different situations. Um, so whether there was a conspiracy behind Sandy Hook, I think, the uh, the the proof to that for somebody that is going to prove that Sandy Hook was a hoax, then that level of um, uh, that level of evidence is that that that's a pretty high bar. Okay, you have more to you have more to digest and prove in that. Nine Eleven is a whole different situation. Nine Eleven is something that if you go down the street today and start polling people. I think that most people think that 9-11 was a conspiracy. Yes, I do. Um, in, in, in 2001, when that went down in 2001, we all assumed it was a couple of terrorists and planes crashed into the buildings, and, and we've got to go fight al-Qaeda. We've got to go to Afghanistan. We've got to go fight these guys. Well, that's what we believe. The the conspiracy theorists, Spare Change and Alex Jones and everything else that was behind starting to spread that message, they are no longer the crazy people. Now, now that is the that that's the establishment. So that's a pretty that's a pretty scary situation that we have to deal with with nine eleven. Well, yeah, your government uh, is yeah. out to get you. I mean that yeah, that's yeah. that's that's synonymous yeah. with your government right. is out to yeah, get yeah. you. Okay? Yeah, yeah, and so today. <laughs> Today, I think that uh, that is the accepted norm. Now, what do I believe about 9-11? Um, <clears throat> this is what I believe. And what I believe is scarier than what you believe, Carrie. And I think that you go for it. Wait, wait. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is what I believe. Yeah. The government knew about it. And that's mm -hmm. all you have to. That's all you had right there. The conversation friggin' stops. Because if they knew... That is bad. That is bad. What what else happened? It doesn't. None of that matters. That's what I believe. Well, the they planned it. Knew. Well, not so, new. They wait, planned wait, it at Sandia wait, Labs. Wait, let you know. Let's wait. Wait, Carrie. Carrie, that's not what I'm saying. What are you saying? Wherever it, whatever goes beyond that, doesn't matter. If they knew, that's all we need to know. That's it. That's it. It's the end of the story. Sure. That's it. That's it. Was yeah, it okay. Sandia? Was it nuclear bombs? Was it was it holograms? It. Was I, it this? Yeah, yeah, was yeah, it time? So was it MK Ultra? Was it? It doesn't. None of that. None of that matters. None of it. None of it. The fact is that they knew, and that's it. And what 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 the truth is beyond that? Everybody, all theories are on the table, and we need to take a look at all of them. I don't know if it was holograms. I don't know if it was missiles. I don't know if it was MK Ultra. I don't know if it was nuclear bombs that brought down uh, uh, the building. I don't know. You know, we have one one person that theorizes one thing. We have another one that theor uh, all of them couldn't be true. We didn't have nuclear bombs and holograms you know, and, and planned demolitions. Well, uh, but, but, but hold on, carry, carry. Yeah. None of that matters. All that matters is that they knew. They knew what was coming, and they didn't tell us. And that right there is the criminal offense. What, what, who and what and why and Cheney and Rumsfeld and, and whoever else and Halliburton and whoever else was behind it and the big money and the military and uh, industry to go and make a bunch of money in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and rebuild those countries after we bomb them into the Stone Age. You know, is that the agenda? I don't know. I really, I, I don't. 
but I do know that they knew. And I know that they lied when they went up in front of the United Nations and waved those little mini bottles of anthrax around, you know, and, and, and plutonium, and here's letters, and this is, and all of that turned out to be a lie, and that's a fact. That is not conjecture. That is not me theorizing. That's a fact. Those were phony letters generated by the CIA presented to Great Britain so they could have evidence of, of anthrax and, and, and nuclear industries and stuff so we could go in and bomb Iraq. That would okay. be well, it also, I mean, of, that's all good. Okay, so Sandy Hook, you, you basically haven't gotten yourself up to date on Sandy Hook. Oh, that's I'm, now fully been, up to, I'm fully right? up to date on Sandy Hook. So that's Sandy been Hook. proven to be a hoax, no. right? No. You don't think no. so? Uh, I think that those guys that present their case, um, without naming names, um, uh, that 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 the defense's case doesn't hold water. Okay, I, 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 Sandy Hook is a is a is a bit different of a situation. Um, what I don't want to do with Sandy Hook, okay, what I don't want to do with Sandy Hook, is take a stance that a I, I, the evidence is not solid enough where I go public with it, and then I have some family come to me and say, you know, my daughter was shot that sure. morning in Sandy Hook by Adam Lanza. I don't want to be party to that, and, okay. and I'm a father. And I, I do not want that until <laughs> until it's, it's, it, there's something that is beyond a reasonable doubt with Sandy Hook. So one thing, one thing, I don't care about dates on... on on websites and, and things are wrong and they were before. I can backdate anything on the web. I can backdate it. I do it every day. I can backdate sure. it. I can go in and change dates. So don't tell me, don't base it on that. Don't base it on ammunition that wasn't, that, that was there and didn't match or they couldn't. No, that, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear about Okay, what about active. no, 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 let's leave. I'm just going to veterans today, just just because, you know, what the hell? I mean, we have a, a time here to, to, to talk about this kind of stuff. I mean, the the bottom line here is no murders in Newtown in 2012. All right, that's a headline here in Veterans Today. You know about mm -hmm. Veterans Today, right? Yep. Okay. And and so basically we've got Jim Fetzer, who's uh, yep. got a, a fair number of degrees here talking yep. about all of this, and it goes into detail about uh, what goes on. Um, the bottom line is, you know, the information is out there. Whether you want to take it on board, whether you want to, you know, still feel right. that there's some open, you know, some missing data. Um, right. There are some anomalous things that are part of Sandy Hook. I, I know that, uh, for example, Mike Harris reported at one point, closer to the date when it was actually happening, that his information was the, that the Mossad was in there. And that they were right. shooting people. Um, right. So something happened there. Somebody got shot. Something right. happened. Uh, right. We don't right. know what. It didn't appear right. to all be a hoax, at least every freaking thing. Now, as far right. as the kids and the whole, you know, Adam Lanza, and, or uh, if that's his name, I forget. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the Patsy, I mean, the bottom line is there was a crackdown on that boy and that family. Uh, he, that, they're a real family. They exist. Um, right. So whether or not that guy is still in jail, whether he's up for, you know, trial or, or actually, I guess he got killed. I can't remember. Um, Who, Adam know, Lanza? Yeah. No, he shot himself. Oh, right. Day. Okay. Suppo well, supposedly shot himself. Suppo I mean, that, look, that okay. you know, we don't know. Look, the guy could be sitting in, on, a, on an island somewhere in the South he Pacific. certainly <laughs> could. There's no question about it. I mean, come it. on. Uh, what could, look, could, could and would the government lie to us? Yes. Did they or uh, lie to us about Sandy Hook? Well, I'm not. I'm not so sure. Let me what just about, say this. What about Flight 370 and then a Flight MH17? You know, have you gone down that that rabbit hole? I, I, I'm fully investigated. Fully investigated. Yeah. And I don't want to. What? Let me make something perfectly clear about Sandy Hook. Sure. Okay. Right now, the everything, not everything, but most, about ninety percent of everything that's been presented. Uh, to, as evidence in this is about the panic of the day. Oh, they said the principal was alive. Oh, the principal was dead. Oh, uh, there was uh, seven people involved and they only captured one and this guy escaped and listen to the, uh, the police uh, radio stuff and I've listened to all of it, Carrie, all of it, all of it, all of it. 
it, all of that, all of it is in the panic of the day. A small town like that with a with the police department running around. They've they've got an elementary school that's been shot up with uh, twenty six people dead. They don't know. They don't know. They didn't know anything that day. So you, you just can't say, oh, there was seven people involved because they said that they were looking. They should have been looking for twenty people. Okay, because it turned out to be one. Okay, but we found that out the next day. But that doesn't mean it was a hoax. It doesn't mean. Well, I no, no, no. There, well, yeah, actually, you have to go. To, yeah, I mean, maybe you haven't heard about the witnesses. It talks about the, the basically the town is like a ghost town right now. These people have left town. I uh, would I too. Think that, <laughs> so, so in the end, we've got people who maybe signed a non-disclosure agreement are no longer sure. coming forward. Maybe uh, yeah. they're in the witness protection. Uh, protection plan who, who, who the hell knows i mean there are so many scenarios that you can go down for any one of these incidents I and mean, that that's not aurora colorado colorado i mean we're bas basic now to get more up to date we're talking about also mh17 which is, yep. is the more recent uh debacle yep. Yep. which seems to also have ties to possibly uh at least a, a virus that was being targeted I don't yeah. know if you listened to my Simon Parks interview, but he basically comes out and says, no, you know, and he, look, he's uh, supposed to be a politician for, for what, what it's worth, uh, a British politician, you know, and he's coming out and saying um, that, that basically what happened with MH17, that was, it was targeted to hit a Russian city. It was supposed to be their 9-11. It was done by the Mossad. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to that. Of course, MH17, uh, 370 having been flown to Diego Garcia. This is what the evidence points at. And from yep. there, we don't know. Possibly used again in the false flag M MH17. We don't know. Um, and there's a lot of evidence. Jim Stone is an excellent uh, ex NSA whistleblower. I don't know if you've talked to him. But I have, and his website is stellar, and I've got a lot of information from Jim Stone. MH17 and MH370, there, there's there's too many things that are glaring in both of those cases that, that just stinks. It smells rancid. Okay. It just does. Right. Um, and, and first off, first off, I, I'm a very logical guy. What are the odds of two out of 12 planes out of the Malaysian airline <laughs> falling out of the sky? Right? What are the odds of that? I have no idea. Yeah. But I, I'm sure that I would win the state lottery way before <laughs> that should have ever happened. Yes. Okay. So that that right there, I have issues with the second, the th second thing about it, uh, MH17, and not only with uh, Jim Stone's excellent research that he has done with the windows and the paint and and so forth. Uh, uh, I I totally commend him. Uh, uh, awesome website, uh, Jim. If you're listening, great job. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, with MH17, the morning that that happened, it, uh, it happened at like 9.30 a.m. Uh, if my numbers are off, it doesn't matter. Shoot me. But let's just say it like this. At 9.30 a.m., plane gets shot out of the sky. At 9.32 a.m., it's reported on CNN. How in the <laughs> heck? Right. And not only that, but CNN and BBC and uh, Fox and ABC and MSNBC and Yahoo, everybody, AP, Reuters, all had the same information. It was a Russian missile. It was this type of missile. It was shot from this spot of the border. It was on this and that. And that. And they, had, uh, it, they knew in advance. They had the script ready to go out of Washington, D.C., and it was fed across to the mass media. That was a, that was planned. One hundred percent. Everybody knew that was going down, and they already had the excuse. They had the backstory. Yeah. They had everything ready to present. Um, you know. So yeah, I mean, seventeen. Look, when when if, if if something like that was presented to me with Sandy Hook, look, if, if one of those kids right now surface, I, hey, I'm alive. Then we've got a whole other thing that we need to okay. Then then we take another look at Sandy Hook, but but Sandy Hook right now everything that is out there to me in my own mind everything that has been presented, I myself with my tiny doofus head, I can explain away. I can't. I don't need to go. I, it's just logic. Just go. Oh come on, come on, come on, come on. Stop, stop. Okay. 
It's a different situation with 9-11. It's a different situation with MH370, MH17. It's a whole other situation with Ebola. All of, the, all of these things we see. Well, we is it really? I mean, you know, let's talk about, we, we don't have a lot of time here, but, but just to go over that whole Ebola thing. Well, it's a different situation. Is it really? I mean, in the end. No, we're being lied to. We're being lied yeah, to. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, what we're really looking at here is a scenario of lies. It doesn't matter if, well, if their mouth is moving, they're lying, in essence. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and especially if it's mainstream, right? So, so, so that's that's where you draw the line. Now, alternative, maybe they're lying, uh, but, but I can guarantee you that mainstream is lying. Now, I got something for you. I don't know if you heard about this. James Cameron, bring it, bring it. Bring it James bring it. Cameron just made a speech, okay, at one of these. Uh, I, I forget. I don't know if it's Davos or which, which, or you know economic forum it was just happened a few days ago this was news james cameron i mean we're talking about like this guy is basically a nazi he's on a podium saying that people like us now that's why i asked you do you believe 9 11 is an inside job basically he said if you believe 9 11 is an inside job you should be locked up okay so he was basically talking about what the what are they going to do in britain to lock down these crazies out there who believe in conspiracies that happen to be conspiracy facts, in my view. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So this guy is is he's running a whole country. <laughs> Not only yeah, it's it's yeah. the bastion of the Illuminati, and the guy is literally saying that you know. The next thing he has to do, not only does he want to take his pass, the passports from the British people that are trying to come back home because, you know, he has he reserves the right to tell, take your passport away, but now what he wants to do, he wants to shut up any dissenting voice that's saying that government is lying and, and basically lock them up. So this is what we've got, a major politician running Britain. This is what he's saying. So, so this is where it's at. Um, you know, God knows, uh, you know, Obama talking about ISIS. I've got, I've got a whistleblower with proof of the money trail funding ISIS and funding sure. Al-Qaeda. Oh, we've been funding ISIS from day one. And there's no question about that. I mean, look, we... Okay, it, it's so, fun out of control, but yeah. But yeah sure, yeah, absolutely. Course. You know, we want to fund our enemies. So, but why? Because to keep this game going, this little game of war. If you don't have an enemy, you can't send your troops in, right? Well, if you don't have an enemy, there's no reason for government. And <laughs> so that's that's the truth. Yeah. You have to look at the big picture uh, across the board. Let me give you a couple of examples. And I'm sure I'm going to uh, inflame people. But if you're, if you're getting angry at me, that's because you don't know and you just learned something. That's, that's <laughs> the only reason why you're angry. Let me give you a couple of examples. The government itself... The need for the government, the need for us to have the government is so we can pave our streets and and have schools. That's basically what we need the government for. But the government, the money side and, and the corporations on the other side, the bigger the government, the bigger the corporations, the bigger the wars, the bigger of needs and so forth. Let me give you an example. Uh, immigration on our, on our borders. Why have we not clamped it down? Obviously, we could stop it. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying we our our country was based on immigration. My family is a family of immigrants. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if there's a problem at the border, then shut it down. We have the capabilities of doing that. Why do we not do it? The more immigrants that come over means we need to have more government institutions in place to control them. Sure. We need to have larger uh, border patrols. We need to have social places in, in place. We need to have jails and internment camps. We need to have all of that. It's, yeah. it's, that that's one element of what I'm talking about. So when we look at Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and everything else that we're funding over in Africa and everything in Somalia and everything that we're doing over there, if we're not doing it, our government is smaller. The money pie is smaller. We're building less helicopters. We're building less guns. We're making less ammunition. There's a, a, a Halliburton is smaller or non-existent. Blackwater is a non-existent thing. So the more that we, we uh, the, the, the bigger the government, the more that the lies are told, Ebola. Ebola is a perfect example. 
Big Farm comes into play. What is it funded by? It's funded by the government. It's funded by our tax dollars. That's it. And you can see it all playing out right in front of it. Carrie, the best thing that anyone, any one of our listeners can do when they listen to mass media is you listen to the story, you read the headline, pick your website, flip it over 180 degrees, and look at its <laughs> underbelly. Yes. Then you find the truth. Yeah. At least you'll be closer to the truth. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what you do. That's what you do. I don't sure. care what it's about. Yeah. A movie review comes in. Oh, this movie sucks. Absolutely. Sucked. Well, you know what? That movie was great then. <laughs> yeah. That's actually that that's what I do. Great. I look yeah, to that, see what they I look to see when they attack a movie what they're really attacking and basically I figure it's probably it's probably the best movie. I tell you, I just saw <laughs> the worst movie that got like the best ratings ratings last weekend. I mean, you know, this Gone Girl, it was a trash. That thing is frickin' trash. Now, I'm sorry, you know, for the actors, because obviously they wanted to make some money. They, you know, want to appear in a movie, whatever. Um, bad taste. The script is incredibly bad taste. And really, it's just a bloodbath for, uh, for, for you know, Satanists and, and, and vampirism. But, uh, but aside from oh, that... Oh, that sounds cool. <laughs> All right, all right, you want to go no, there? No, 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 you're absolutely right. You're talking about the new Ben Affleck film? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so so what I'm saying, okay, now just to get back to this situation, because, look, we haven't mentioned it, but let's let's bring it in here. The Secret Space Program, because you've seen at least three vehicles, two of which sound very logical uh, to be, be one of ours, so to speak. Um, you're a psychic intuitive. Do you think the, you know, are you are you aware of the secret space program? Are you on base with this? Are you asking your guests about this? And are you following the money trail? As you know, I had Peter LeBend on this week. Phoenix risen from the ashes. Peter <laughs> LeBend was on. And um, I, I asked Peter, and uh, an amazing show, by the way, and everybody listening, if you really want to go see something Pretty cool. Go check out the Peter Lavenda interview that we did because Peter hasn't spoken public in a couple of years. And uh, we all thought he was missing. And it was funny. I, I didn't tell you this, Kerry. He sent me an email right before the show. And he goes, uh, man, have you read this yet? And it was your link. <laughs> <laughs> Peter is alive. Um, but anyway, uh, go check that out. Now, I asked Peter to define the secret space program because to me, there's three definitions of what we're talking about here, okay? The secret space program that Peter refers to is what uh, Von Braun and the Nazis were up to from 1947 uh, up to Apollo and how they uh, uh, the Nazis infiltrated, and we did that, a paperclip and all of that, but also sabotaged the program and made sure that the Russians were ahead of us until they got roped in and told, look, you're going to really be in a bad spot if you don't get us on the moon by 1969. Okay, so they got back on board. Remember, we had all of the best scientists, and somehow they get Sputnik into space before us in 1958 and 59. Uh, they were clearly beating us on all fronts, and it was because the secret space program was being sabotaged. Okay, so that's 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 his definition. Okay, so that's one definition. The other secret uh, space program definition is the one that you're referring to now, and that we we can talk about. So that there's two different things. If somebody wants to go to listen to Peter Lavenda's presentation on the secret space program, it's not going to be about what you and I are about <laughs> to talk about. Okay, all right, are we clear? Well, we're we're not in complete agreement because, as far as I'm concerned, he's just talking about the the beginnings of the secret space program. So it's not like it's a different subject; it's the same subject. It's just earlier in history, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, 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 Carrie. I don't want to be at odds, but I just want to be very clear. When he's referring to the secret space program, it's about the sabotage that was done secretly. That was the program that the Nazis were up uh, <laughs> that that they were up to, and shutting down and not allowing progress to happen between 1947 and 1960. That's what his presentation is about. The secret space program that it, today that we're talking about does it exist? Absolutely, 100%. It does. Do we have 
does the Air Force have a space shuttle that they're flying? Yeah, we know we know this. What is it doing up there? Well, you know, it's doing something very, it's doing bad things. Have we been to Mars? I believe that we have. Do we have a base on Mars? I believe that we do. Do that's the secret space. Okay, program but you're in. Be- I mean, you know, just for 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 edification. I mean, it is interesting because, you know, I have had Peter Lavenda on my show uh, years ago. Uh, did a, did a radio show with him, and uh, good guy. And I've read his books. Uh, very cool guy. Wonderful, wonderful investigative reporter. Really, uh, for all intents the, and purposes. The best. And. The uh, best. And really going down the Jimi Hendrix, just for people that don't know who he is, uh, going down, you know, what is in essence the Illuminati uh, infiltration and and what has gone on and how the 60s were were infiltrated and managed by the think tanks, Rand, uh, Tavistock, and so on. Uh, Also the Manson murders, the the trail of the octopus, so to speak, that goes down those levels. So he's... He's very much aware of the occult. He's also very much aware of basically, you know, the sort of more pragmatic earth-based uh, when he's looking for a clue and finding it here right in front of your eyes uh, and, 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 a, and an excellent writer as well. So yeah, he's Peter drawing Lavenda, his information Peter from Le- that kind of place. Peter Lavenda sleeps with one eye open, trust me. <laughs> he, he's been to places that you and I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm not I, so sure about myself, but I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, but okay, fair enough. Uh, but to get on with the subject, really, okay, so this, that's good because people are going to want to know where you're coming from. Do you understand this? Are you following this, this story of, of what's, what's really going on? You know, did yeah, we go well, to the see, moon? Did we have I, help? What about E.T.? Uh, you've had visitors. You, you've seen craft. You know, having a sensibility of that means that you're willing to entertain information that comes from places that a lot of people will just put up a wall and say, no, I'm not listening. That's right. That's right. Yeah. This is what needs to seriously be driven home. Us, society, people of Earth, we only know what we're told. You don't learn something without experience and somebody telling you something. And it always points back to the mass media, school books, teachers, the news. That's that's where we gather our information, most of it, every single day. And the mass media, when uh, things stopped with Apollo for for no reason, no reason, just stop, that's it, it's it's done. We, We went, we're done, there's nothing there. No, no. Flip that story over. Flip it over. 180 degrees. What? What's there? uh, There's nothing on the moon. Yes, there is. Flip it over. 180 degrees. Nothing on the moon. Yes, there is. Flip it over. The moon is not important. Flip it over. The moon is important. Mars. No life on Mars. There's life on Mars. (laughs) Flip everything over 180 degrees. And that's what you have to understand when it comes to the media. They're, 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 all of the excuses for shutting down the Apollo program back then and more so today made no sense. None. They didn't make – all of us were like, huh? <laughs> the, you know, I remember uh, one of the statements that came out of Washington in 1974. The public is not interested in space anymore. Oh, right. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> who who made that call, pal? Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? And what happened just shortly after that? What, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? <laughs> yes, yes. And every other great space movie that sells out for, for history. You know, so, yeah, all the books, all of, and every, all the fascination is about what's out there. The biggest question we have, the number one question going back 10,000 years, are we alone? We look up at the stars and wonder what is out there. We don't care about anything else. <laughs> the only thing we want to know is are we alone? And, and, and as long as the media, and as long as, as Washington, D.C. wants to poo-poo the subject and not talk about it, then that means there's something there. Their silence on it speaks volumes. 
the longer that they're, the, they're quiet, Carrie, the more that we have something to say. That's it. As yeah, long as sure. they want to be in <laughs> denial, then, then that's it. Silence. It allows all of us, all of us, to write our own story. It allows us to do our own investigations. The only, the only thing, I'm getting angry now. We should have been like this an hour and a half ago because <laughs> my blood is boiling. Is this. When, when, uh, when we have to look to Carrie Cassidy's of the world, the Graham Hancock's of the world, the Richard Dolan's of the world, you know, uh, uh, any, anybody that, uh, Jimmy Church, who am I? You know, but we're the ones that are questioning everything. You question. <laughs> that we're the ones. Yeah, 150 absolutely. years, yes, 150 years ago. 200 years ago, when we're trying to uh, read blood and we're trying to figure out infections and we're trying to figure out the universe and we're trying to figure out what's on the other side of the ocean and the horizons and, and we questioned everything. We didn't accept what we were told. The Vatican, we're the center of the universe. We're the only things here. We, the sun orbits around us. Right? Yeah. Okay? Okay. We questioned everything. And if it wasn't for everybody questioning, we wouldn't be where we are today. Now, suddenly, we, when we want to question everything, we're crazy. Oh, that guy's crazy. No, no. You know, that's the answer that we get. All the skeptics in Washington and the mass media, look at the way they treated the Malibu base. The Malibu base is right there. You know what? Let's go find out what it is. Don't, don't laugh at it. Right. You know, when, when Area 51 was disclosed, Bob Lazar is a kooky guy. He's crazy. He's insane. Let's, let's ruin him. You know, let's make him crazy. And everybody, well, it turned out that base really did exist. It's right there. You know, and, and without that, without people questioning things, the Michael Cremos of the world, you know, um, uh, the Joseph P. Farrells of the world, we need these guys. And that's where we're getting our knowledge from these days. And we're smarter than that. We're growing up and we're starting to figure that out. Again, mass media, take it, whatever it is, flip it over, and you got the truth. And uh, and I'll leave you with that. Carrie, you, you are the best. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Jimmy Church. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, wow. I've got to uh, see what have I done here. <laughs> I, can't I'm, I just... Just made you huge on the screen. Uh, okay, guys, I, I didn't see any questions offhand. I don't see any burning questions in the uh, You know, if you want to have any last-minute burning questions, uh, now's the time. Jimmy has to go. He's got a, he's got a show tonight. Um, I hope I covered everything. I tried to keep my eye on the chat room here to see if there was anything that I was missing. Um, I'm sure that we could go on all night and all day. Uh, Jimmy, just, just basically talking about everything. So you, you're checking out, I, it, it looks like uh, <laughs> mystery lights yep. and water. I don't know what somebody's talking, mystery lights and water. I suppose you mean, are there any craft coming out of that area of the ocean? Look, that's one of the hottest sightings areas. Uh, Malibu, there's a guy who wrote a book. Um, what's that guy's name, Jimmy, who wrote the book about the sightings in Malibu? Preston Dinner. Yeah. Uh, he, he wrote a whole book about how what a hot hot spot that is. Always been a hot spot, just FYI. Um, any any hot questions in your um, chat there? Any, any hot questions okay, in your on, chat? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I was just checking out the chat room. Um, and I tried to post in the chat room and I had to register and then we went live and I didn't get it done. So, But hi, everybody. Um, the mystery lights in the water, I think what they are referring to was last month, Alaska... Uh, I think it was Japan Airlines had photographed uh, these uh, bright orange, red, and yellow, and white orbs in the water in the Pacific Ocean. Absolutely stunning uh, photographs. Uh, um, uh, we analyzed them. What we did find, it wasn't a volcano, because that would be too deep in the water and we wouldn't see that light from the surface, so that, that killed that. Some suspected it was schools of octopus that were glowing and so but each one of these circles was the same size. So uh, have we found out uh, spheres, I should say, not circles, uh, disc shape, if you will, too, as well, from the air? Uh, have we figured out what they were? No. But they certainly lit up a vast amount of the Pacific Ocean. 
And so uh, just stay abreast with us and, and stay stay on top of uh, JimmyChurchRadio.com and the show. We, uh, we have posted those photographs. They are insane, and we are continuing uh, the analysis. They have not been debunked. By okay, anybody. well, let me just say the earthquakes in Oklahoma, it looks like maybe they're just uh, – building a, an extension to their underground base. Same with the recent um, earthquakes in Colorado. Uh, Mammoth is another matter. I'm sure they're also trying to trigger the, uh, the, the, the New Madrid Fault, so you can keep an eye on that. Um, it, look, this is this stuff to, to consider when you get any kind of report of anything. So it's not, it's not only turning things on its head. But basically understanding that when you get a weather report, understanding that there are weather wars, we don't have any rain in California. We haven't had it for a long time. Look, somewhere else is getting rain. Uh, they're storing it up. They will fix this area. <laughs> it's my theory because there's a major aerospace, uh, you know, funding comes from, from here and the bases are all here. So ultimately we will get rain. Uh, they will save this area over and over again because of that. Um, you know, don't just look at surface earth. Look under the earth. What are they doing under the earth to cause what you see on top and, and the weather wars? Any, any at, uh, additional last words from you, Jimmy Church? Uh, Thank you. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Carrie, it's very important that, uh, uh, that you uh, continue uh, to wave the flag, to continue to march. We are all rolling this rock uphill every single day. We do this together. Um, our community, uh, yours and mine, we speak to each other about this all the time. But what everybody needs to understand, we are a very small group of individuals. You know, we, we talk about different shows or, you know, we can all talk smack and we do. I think a lot of it is tongue in cheek. We, what we do all know is that we all know each other and we all need each other. And I'm talking about our little fringe scientific research community of not only whistleblowers, but of scientists and, and people that write and research. It's very important. And, 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 and we're all, all of us know each other. You know, we could sit, we could have a, we could have a Skype call right now. We, you can go through your Skype contact list. <laughs> I can go through mine and we could have 50 people up here on this screen right now. We all know each other and we all respect each other. And it's very important that we keep our foot on the gas, that we ignore uh, the critics, the trolls, the pundits, um, uh, the name callers and stuff. I, I choose to ignore all of it. I, I don't care. Um, and, and that's it. And it's, it's, uh, it's a very serious thing that we do. And, and we care about it. And, and the people that listen to us know. The people that don't listen to us are the ones that I'm speaking to right now. You know, if, if you know what I'm saying. Sure. It's very, very important. So thank you much. Uh, yeah, I've got a show to do. Everybody, if you want to come check me out tonight, uh, we've got Graham Hancock live for three straight hours at, uh, at over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Thank you for the opportunity, Carrie. When you're ready, come on down. All right. Excellent. Okay. All right. You I'll take care. You. Thank you. All the best. We're coming down Latuna Canyon into the valley, and Rita turns to me and says, what is that? And I look, and our sunroof was open in the car, and I looked to where she was looking. She's looking up, and right out of the windshield, pew, it was a white orb globe. I have no idea how big, but I'm going to say 20 meters, maybe across 30 feet. Um, and it landed. It, came, it, it lasted for about a second straight down and landed like in downtown Van Nuys. And I was expecting a, a huge explosion. Okay, that's what I thought. And nothing happened. I immediately, immediately called Wolf McCarran of MUFON and said, Wolf, did you see that? No. Any reports? No. I said, note this right now. It's 1024. We just had a sighting. Something strange. And, uh, and, we didn't know what it was. And the next day, well, I immediately went home and checked all the websites, KABC, you know, all, all the local news channels, nothing. It didn't make sense to me how you could have three, four million people in the valley and something like that happen and nobody mentioned it. 
I followed the LA Times for about a week, and there was nothing there. And nobody reported anything on MUFON. I know what I saw. It was crazy. It didn't leave a light trail or anything. It was just a bright flash of, of a round, it was white, glowing orb. And it just streaked right right to downtown Van Nuys. And I thought... What a it, trip. It, it, yeah. And then... Okay, what uh, year was that? Do you know? That would have been 2010. Oh, so not that long ago. No, no, very recent. Okay. And then about a year ago, I just spoke about this at a, at a seminar, and the video is online. Uh, I was in the Honda parking lot of Honda over here in the valley, um, uh, Galpin Honda. And I'm walking out of the building, and I see, you know, five or six of the Helpa Honda blue shirt guys right, <laughs> standing out in the middle of the parking lot there, car salesman looking at the sky and as i'm walking out another honda salesman walked up to me and he goes check out the ufo and they were all looking and i turn and i look up to the sky and there was uh, a spinning uh i don't know what it was really it was a spinning way up high in the atmosphere again moving very slowly i don't know if it was a satellite He's researching and involved and reading um, but, but for everybody else, I'm, I'm sort of new and I get that. I understand. Uh, I, I stepped in for Art Bell about a year ago. It's been a year now that I've been in, uh, the chair and, uh, I, I came from a sports background, but before, uh, or I don't even really need to mention that, but yes, I had a successful show and, and. And sports casting was always a passion, and sports are a passion, but it's not what I wanted to do. Uh, I was on with George Norrie, as you know, last week, and George asked me the same question. And and he said, you know, how did you make that, that transformation from sports, you know, a successful sports show, to this? And I, I said, I came out of the closet. And this is what I've always <laughs> wanted to do. I came out of the closet. And now I'm happy. Uh, the best way to, to try to explain it is here I did, a, uh, I did my show last night for three hours. I'm off the air last night. I wind down. What am I doing first thing this morning? I'm on with you, Carrie. And I'm happy. In, in a couple of hours, I'm doing my show again. Tonight, I, uh, we were just talking. I have Graham Hancock on the show. Who cannot be happier than enjoying that type of success. Uh, I have been welcomed, for the most part, with open arms into the UFO community. And I think that they need, or paranormal, I should say, community. And I think that they, uh, you, everybody else, they needed a breath of fresh air, another uh, a take, another look at it, and somebody that takes it very, very serious. And I think that has a lot to do with the success of the show in that, um, here comes a guy from a different background, and it's coming in, um, kick-starting and re-kick-starting uh, the paranormal, the fringe sciences, and, and taking it very, very serious. And I think that has a lot to do with it. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's true. Absolutely. Uh, well, okay. But, but in terms of your background, like, you know, growing up and all of this, uh, and, and I, I don't know, maybe you've been asked these things before, but... I don't know this. Uh, have you seen a UFO? Yes. Three. Okay. Three. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I have. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it on, on the quick side. Uh, the, first, uh, the first sighting I had was up in Monterey. And I was up there with some friends, and we were photographing uh, our and, and so forth. Now, backing up, if you want to back up before that, before the, my, my sightings, um, my mom was a crazy woman. And so I grew up, uh, in, a, in, in the best, uh, most endearing of terms of crazy, she was awesome. And she was, this was in the 60s and early 70s, she was in Edgar Casey. She was into ghost writing. She, her, and and my aunt Z, who just passed away last week, uh, would sit around and Ouija board all night and drink coffee. <laughs> and I'm I'm five years old watching this. Stuff. Okay, and where did you grow up? 
uh, I was an army brat, so we did it all around the world. You know, every three years, new new city, new country, new ah, army base, that kind of thing. My dad was in the army band. He was in the army band. Okay. What did he play? Yep. Uh, trombone. He and was he, band leader, actually. He was band master, so okay. he was the guy conducting the orchestra. And you uh, you actually are a musician as well, right? Yes. Yep, 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 yep. You play yep. guitar? Uh, play guitar. Uh-huh. Yep. Okay, so now, so, okay, fast forward from here, uh, and you're growing up, well, uh, in various places. Is there any place that you spent, uh, you know, more time than not when you were a kid? Uh, no, not really. It, it pretty much three, three years, you know, this, the standard military issue every three years. But you pull three up years around the United States or around the world? Around the world. Uh, uh, Germany, uh, as well as Panama, South America or Central America. Um, I was there when I was older. I was there when I was in my teens in high school. So, and then back to the United States. So, okay. The, the rotation went like this. So we were Chicago at Fort Sheridan. Uh, Indianapolis at Fort Ben Harrison, uh, Kalamazoo, when my dad went to music school at Western Michigan, uh, Würzburg, Frankfurt, uh, and then back to the States again. We went back to Fort Harrison for a second tour, and then that was it. That was, uh, that was it for me. I stayed in Indianapolis until I came out to California. Okay, and you've been in California how long? Uh, since 1983, 1984. Oh, so, so you're, so you're, a basically a local to, <laughs> yeah, now, now, now I'm from California. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so now we're up to the second sighting. So what, then what happened? Second sighting was my wife and I, Rita, were here in the Valley. We were coming off of, uh, La Tuna Canyon Road off of the 210, which, uh, for everybody here, that's the, uh, that's the east side of the valley, coming from Pasadena into the valley. We're coming out of the mountains. So this is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I'm here with Jimmy Church. And, uh, wow, it's really early in the morning. <laughs> yes, it is. Here in L.A. Yeah. for me. Uh, for us, night, night owls, those types. Uh, so, uh, Jimmy, thank you for waking up uh, on time to do this today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always a pleasure, Carrie. You know that. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is just very casual. We, uh, you know, I, I was on your show. I've been on your show twice. And, uh, and I just thought we, we have to return the favor. So here we are. And um, I, I know it's the middle of the day. The reason this is not at night, guys, is because Jimmy's on the radio at night. So uh, this was our only option. Um, so uh, we've got a chat going. You've got a chat going. So we can also take questions from the chat as we go or, or near the end, whatever, whatever works out. Um, what I want to do is, first of all, <laughs> uh, let's, let's give you some background because this is your interview. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you um, who you are and, and how you got into this sector. And I, I know some of these answers and maybe some of your fans know these answers, but we could have new people on board who don't know who Jimmy Church even is, even though sure. I think your word is getting out there uh, very quickly. Well, um, and I'm, yeah, it, it's kind of funny because I've done a lot of, uh, and it's, uh, again, thank you for having me on the show. And I, let me say this to everybody. Carrie and I uh, talk probably a few times a week. Uh, very long, animated uh, conversations on the phone, and we always... Uh, stop ourselves in the middle of the conversation and wish that we could share those conversations with everybody. Um, and, and so we're, what we're doing now is what we do all week long. And uh, so uh, hopefully we'll capture some, some of that magic. But um, I've done a lot of media uh, over the last month or two, and I've had that same question. Jimmy, where did you come from? And um, because we have such an old established uh, uh, community in ufology. 
I've always felt like I was a part of that community because I was always at the edge of the ocean. We we're on mountain bikes and we stopped and we were taking turns. There was four of us and we were taking turns, taking pictures of ourselves. So, you know, three, one taking the picture of three guys, right? And then we were rotating. So everybody would get in the shot. And it was my turn to take the picture. And one of the guys says, what is that? And he points up to the sky. And it was an old, uh, you know, film camera. This is 1995, 1996. And I look up and there's a black triangle. But it was high, high, high. I'm guessing 50,000 feet you know, way up in the, in the clouds, but it was ripping across the sky. And I grabbed the camera. It was moving so fast. You know, a jet at that height moves very, very slow across the sky. We're used to this. This was hauling butt. I want to use another <laughs> word. And, and so I grab the camera and I take a shot. By the time I wound the camera, I go up and look again, and it was stationary and then shot straight up into the clouds and disappeared into the atmosphere. That was about five, four o'clock in the afternoon, bright sky. And about six months later, I was developing the film. Uh, I had a bunch of film and, and I come across these pictures of clouds. I was like, what, what, what is this? And there was that black triangle. And I, I put a jeweler's loop on it and it turned out it wasn't a black triangle. It was a black pyramid. Okay. Really? And it was a like a square bottom, just like a pyramid in Egypt, square bottom with a, with a triangle top, way up in the sky, way, way, way high. So that was my first one. Uh, the and second, there's, let me just say, there is a military base right off Monterey, so. Yes, yes, yes. It could have been anything, but it was the way that it, well, it had no wings either. It, that was the weird thing. Very weird. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Way back how, then. Cool. Yeah, how, how it was flying, I have no idea. But that was something that, uh, and I'll be honest with you, Carrie, I didn't tell anybody about that for years. But but uh, let me ask you right there, because did you, were you like a UFO kind of person at that point? Or yes. was this your first oh, yeah. exposure? Oh, 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 I was involved in Paranet. <laughs> when Paranet was was on the net back, uh, you know, at the, the very first start of uh, uh, the Internet and, and UFO Mind and all of those early, early websites. Now, before that, yeah, I, I read Fowler's books and uh, Communion 